G'day and welcome back to RC Model Reviews. Going to do a bit of a trip down memory lane today. I want to look at receivers. I want to look at the technology, the components, and the way these things are designed these days. Now, what I've got on the bench here at the moment is actually an old-fashioned FM receiver. It's an Airtronics FM receiver. These were probably made late 80s, maybe 90s, I'm not sure. Maybe I'll look, see if I've got a date code on this chip. But um, I want to take a look at this as the place where we start. And here we go. This is just a seven channel receiver and the date code says 1997. So it was made 20 years ago. That's a long time ago. Anyway, almost 20 years ago. So let's have a look at what we got for our money 20 years ago when we bought a radio control receiver. Now this, as I said, is FM. It's not digital. It's just plain old FM. And if you look in here, there is a snot load of stuff. There's two boards for a start. Notice there's two boards. And there's so much stuff wedged in there. And there are components in there that we don't see these days in modern radio control receivers. So I'm going to take a little bit of a look and try and explain to you what's going on here. Now, there are two boards. The top board here is, which board is it? Let's have a look. Yep, this board here, this one here, this little board, is the RF board. So what's happening here is we have our receiver antenna comes in, drops down here to this little circuit here. And in here we have a little coil, probably usually used two coils. They had what they called a twin-tuned front end. And once the camera focuses, these were just two little coils that we used to um, screen out frequencies other than the ones we're operating. Now, this is a 72 megahertz receiver, so these coils are quite large compared to what we have on today's modern equipment. There's a crystal in here. Now, a crystal, that's a little device that enables us to create a frequency at a very high precision. The crystal here, basically the 72 megahertz came in and it got modified or mixed with another frequency that produced an output that was much lower in frequency, 10 megahertz. The 10 megahertz, I think this is maybe not on this one. Yes, it is, I think, because there is another slot for a crystal over here. So this basically converted it down to, um, oh, I think the mix was on this side. Sorry, here we go. And look at this. These components here, transistors, and they're what we call through hole because the legs go through the holes and soldered on the other side. You don't see much of that, if any of that, today. Today we have surface mount components, which I'll show you in a moment. But yeah, so sorry, the receiver signal comes in and then it gets tuned and then there's an oscillator here which has got a crystal and that's a separate crystal you can plug these crystals in and out and here is one of those crystals and as you can see it has a channel number on it 28 and if we pull that off well actually if we can get it off because sometimes they don't come off very easily and this one isn't going to come off no anyway on the crystal itself there would be the frequency written on there which would be in megahertz this first oscillator, controlled by this crystal, converts the frequency down to a much lower frequency of 10.7 megahertz. So it goes from 72 down to 10.7. The reason we do that is it's much easier to filter signals at a lower frequency. So 10.7 megahertz. And then over here we have another crystal, another oscillator, which brings it down to 455 kilohertz, half of, just about half a megahertz, which is even lower, so we can get even sharper filtering. And the reasons that they used two oscillators and, and two intermediate frequencies was to improve the rejection of unwanted frequencies. Very complicated, really. I'm not going to go through the thing in depth. But you notice here there's wax on the top of these because these little components had to be tuned. All these little co coils here had to be tuned, and that one, and this one. So there was a lot of setup involved. You didn't just put all the bits on and then ship it out the door. You actually had to assemble it, tune it, and align it, they call it. Aligning it. So make sure it was all tuned into exactly the right frequency. And of course, these were not spread spectrum. These were fixed frequency. So you had to be careful that you only operated on the frequency that you were using. There was no one else using that frequency or you'd get shot down. There was no rejection of anyone else on the same frequency. Bit of a shame. Now, so this was the radio frequency board. This did all the radio frequency stuff, converted the signals right down to a low frequency, then turned them into a digital stream. And then this board here has a little chip which is used to decode the digital stream into each of the seven servo outputs on here. So quite a big thing. Things that were bad about this was that these coils contain ferrite, which is quite heavy. So in a bad crash, they can actually get bent out of shape. And because this is through hole stuff, it's pretty easy for something like these transistors here to get bent over. And in an impact, you know, this could get bent like that, but doing, and then it can cause problems. So yeah, through hole stuff was old school. It was pretty unreliable compared to modern stuff. So, and even things like, so how are you going? That they've had to glue stuff in here to stop it wobbling around and crashes and things. So there's a lot of glue holding this together. You know, this is sort of like rubbery silicon glue. And so it's a bit how you going. It's all a bit, goodness me. Um, and that was it, basically. Pretty straightforward, pretty simple. They were quite expensive, though. I mean, you'd be paying, you know, $50, $60 for a good FM receiver. And, you know, they weren't that good compared to what we have today. But that's the type of construction. Now there are some surface mount components. This is, I was hoping to find something older, but I couldn't find anything older than this. 
and so this just had to do. But suffice to say that there are some surface mount components here, things that are actually mounted on, on the side of the board, um, capacitors and so forth, actually mounted directly on top of the board. This circuit here is an example of it. And if we move forward a little bit, I'm going to go forward to another receiver. This is one from Hitech, and it's much bigger. It's an 8-channel receiver, but my God, look at the size of it. In fact, I'll pull out of it so you can see that. Right, that's the Hitech receiver. This is the Airtronics one beside it. You can see that this is quite a bit narrower because they have used two boards. But overall, there's probably the same amount of components there. And what they've done is they've just increased the height a bit by using those two boards stacked like that. Not much, though. It's quite a clever package, this. But this is just a single board FM receiver by Hitech. Well, let's have a quick look at that and I'll show you. It's got all the same stuff. In fact, it's much easier to see what's going on with this because it's all laid out on a single board. So our long wire antenna here takes the signal right across over here where it joins onto one of these coils. Now this is the, the tuning coil for the, well, we've got tuning coils here for the front end. I think this is probably the double tuned front end here. I haven't actually looked closely. I'm pretty sure that's probably double tuned front end with these two cans. Notice these are quite big and they, because they've got things that have to be adjusted, aligned or tuned, they tune the 72 meg frequency so that the receiver is sensitive to that. Then we have a little crystal here and this crystal then converts it down to 10.7 megahertz where it's further amplified and filtered. And then there is another, well this is, a, this, this is the, yeah. Well, we've actually this has got three crystals in it. I don't know what's going on here actually. I haven't looked at this before, but here is another crystal. Sorry, bang the thing. This, these are pluggable, of course, because you want to change frequencies. If someone was operating on your frequency, you had to change your crystal. So they plugged in, and this one has a, like the other one has a channel number on it. I don't know what channel, 72 megahertz. Anyway, so this here converts the incoming frequency down to 10.7, but I don't know why there are two other crystals in this, because normally you just have one other crystal to bring it down to 455, where we have something here. This is actually a ceramic filter, and these are, these replace some of the cans that were in the other receiver. And these are some more tuning cans, intermediate frequency cans. And see all these adjustments. Look at all the adjustments. And of course, over time, sometimes these adjustments would shift. With vibration, these could spin around. Notice these ones are not waxed. So these could spin around with vibration. And your receiver, you lose all your range and think bad things happen. So, mm. and again, this has some through-hole components. These crystals are through-hole. As you can see, the, the wires from the crystals go right through to the bottom. These capacitors are through hole. We've got a through hole resistor over here, which goes through to the other side. But having said that, there are still some surface mount parts. See, so this is sort of a combination of the really old tech and the technology that was coming along a little later. And this is what we call a double sided load. Both sides of the circuit board actually have components on them. So that's how they managed to keep the size down. But even so, it is a huge receiver. Um, and over here, we have some more digital circuitry. Oh, sorry, that's the radio chip and then we have some other circuitry here and there's our servo output so here's a lot of stuff on these things huge amount of stuff um, compared to what we have today and the size the, it's just huge i'm just going to measure this on the board here and it is i'm going to do it metric because we're metric people it's 55 by where are we 55 by 37 or 38 millimeters that's enormous fantastically large thing and of course heavy as well you know put those on the scales it's going to weigh a bit so yeah that's a uh, it's a high-tech receiver in fact where's the lid for it it is the rcd 3800 if you have one of these you can play along at home see that um, it's dual conversion shift selectable 72 megahertz maybe the other crystal here is because they had shift selectable shouldn't be necessary to do a crystal use a crystal for that but if you want to know what shift as well back in the you know Although this is an FM receiver, you might think, I could use it with any FM transmitter. No, you couldn't, because there was a bit of a battle going on between Futaba and JR and Airtronics and all these other companies. And there's, there's two ways you could make this signal shift. It was frequency modulated, so it could either modulate down or up. And of course, Futaba and Hitech went one way, and JR and Airtronics went the other way. So you had to shift. So to try and sell as many receivers as possible, Hitech brought out this receiver where you could select which... Um, where you wanted, which shift you wanted on the thing. So you could use this receiver with a Futaba transmitter or with the JR transmitter by simply using this little lead here, this little plug here to select which type of shift you had. Very clever. And I think they sold a bundle of these. These were actually a really good receiver. I really was impressed with these in the day. So let's move forward a few more years. And here's another. This again, this is an FM receiver, but it's a bit of a, it's got a bit of a difference. It had some smart processing circuitry so that it was far more uh, resilient to interference. It would actually take frames and compare them, take each packet of data and compare the one to the previous one. And if there were some major differences, it would reject it because it figured it's probably interference. And it would also make sure that all the timing signals were right. So it was a very clever receiver. This is the Corona receiver. This really put Corona on the map. This established them as quite a player in the RC marketplace as a manufacturer of uh, receivers. 
back in the day. Now, this you'll notice is a bit different. There's nowhere near as many of these little tin cans on this receiver. It's, but there's these white things, right? So what's happened is as technology has advanced, instead of having to have little coils that you tune manually, they produce these ceramic filters. There was one in the high tech, but only one. These, this uses a lot of ceramic filters. These do the same job as the coils, but they do it much better. They don't need tuning, and they sometimes they're more robust, not always, um, and they do a really good job. Now, what we've got here is uh, a 10.7 and a 4.55. I think this is a dual conversion receiver. So again, we have two lots of filtering, one at one frequency, one at another frequency. This is a crystal, so this crystal here converts from the 10.7 to the 455 kilohertz. Here's the crystal that controls the frequency the receiver operates on, just like the other receivers we looked at. Each receiver in the FM world required a crystal to lock it onto the frequency you were using. And so there's not much to see on there, but again, it is a double-sided load. All the digital and other goodness is on the back side. And now we're starting to see things like these orange tantalum capacitors instead of those electrolytic ones. I'll show you an electrolytic. Where'd that receiver go? Hang on. Um, this is an electrolytic capacitor. It's a little metal can. It has legs, goes through the circuit board. These, um, for a given amount of capacity, they're quite big. So tantalums came along, and these are much smaller for the same amount of capacity. So it makes for a smaller receiver design. And this is a much smaller receiver. I'll pull out and I'll compare it to that high-tech so you can see the difference in size. Now, both of these are eight-channel receivers. This is the high-tech. This is the Corona. You'll notice that this is much smaller. And this has the benefit, it has that digital processing circuitry to reduce the effect of interference. These were really, really fantastic receivers as well. Two of the best receivers on the market at the time. But this did it a different way to that. But they're still bus just basically fixed crystal oscillator receivers. So if you wanted to change frequencies because someone else came along and wanted to fly on the same frequency you're on, you had to change crystals in your transmitter and in your receiver. And here's another receiver from that era. This is the FMA M5. This was a brilliant little receiver. Too. I used a lot of these. And you notice this one is labeled Futaba type. Now, um, FM, FMA made receivers for different, compatible with different transmitters. This was for a Futaba type. That's that shift I was talking about. This receiver would not work with a JR transmitter. And the JR type wouldn't work with a Futaba transmitter because of the way they dicked around with the different modulation. So there we go. Five channels, one, two, three, four, five. And it's FM. And it's dual conversion, which means it does that two frequency shifts, one down to 10.5 megahertz and one down to 455 kilohertz. And you notice it has got quite a few coils in there. It's got a ceramic, two ceramic filters. Is that a ceramic filter? No, that's a crystal, sorry, looking through the plastic. There's a, a crystal, that's one of the ones that does the down conversion. And ceramic filter. And she's got one, two, oh, interesting. This has got another set of crystals as well. Very interesting. I don't know why. I should be looking at the circuit diagram. Normally a dual conversion receiver has two crystals. They've got electrolytics in there. So this doesn't not quite as advanced as the Corona was, but it is a very, very small receiver. In fact, we'll compare those side by side. You can see the difference. Right, I've pulled right out now so you can get a comparison of the sizes of these different FM receivers. This is the 8-channel high-tech. This is the 7-channel Airtronics. This is the 8-channel Corona. And this is the 5-channel FMA. And as you can see, they're getting smaller and smaller and smaller. But now I'm going to introduce some of the modern stuff for you to compare this to. And here's a typical modern, I think this is an 8-channel receiver, um, 2.4 gigahertz. And you'll notice one thing immediately, there's no coils at all. This is actually, it might look a bit like a coil, it's a little button for the bind. There are no coils at all, none of those adjustable things, nothing at all is adjustable on this receiver. It's all done with software and microcomputer chips. It's not much of a double-sided load. There is some stuff on the back, but not very much. Here's some of these ceramic capacitors. We haven't seen those before. These are another uh, very, very small form of capacitor. And the crystals, well, that's a crystal there. Look how tiny that crystal is, how small it is. So it is really robust. It's not going to get broken because the older crystals, they tend to be pretty fragile and they get damaged if you had a really bad crash. These ones, tough as old boots, and these capacitors also very tough. And because there's nothing going through, there's no holes, no components poking through the board, there's nothing to flop around on the top. And here we have all the, the radio frequency goodness is, is done in all these little chips here. And then here's our microcomputer that does all the other stuff. Um, another crystal there. And really, I mean, there's nothing to see. It's so small and there's so little stuff on there. It makes them very light. But the big thing is it makes them so damn durable, so robust. You know, these things, because these things are all so light, there's no moment of inertia. When you have a really bad crash, these things aren't trying to rip themselves off the board because they're just so light. And because they can be put together basically they fall off the end of the assembly line and they're programmed and that's it there's no tuning there's no farting around they are actually cheaper to produce much cheaper to make these than the old-fashioned ones so what i'm going to do now is i'll show you uh, that receiver against the the high tech and you can just you, you'll see the obvious differences 
There you can go. That's what happens in a span of 20 years. This is 1997, this is 2016. And of course, there are much smaller versions than this. Um, I'm not going to open up the box, but, um, well, I will. I'll open up the box, but I won't rip the receiver apart because I haven't used this one yet. Um, here is an example. This is the Fly Sky when I can get it out. I should have done this before. Here is a Fly Sky, uh, sorry, a Free Sky receiver. Look at the size of that damn thing. Look how thin that is. And that is a receiver. Compared to what we had in the old days, I mean, it's fantastic difference. Look, it's just a fraction of the size. And of course, there are smaller ones than this now. You can get smaller receivers than that. And what can I say? Technology marches on. I'm so glad that our equipment has become so much more robust, so much more efficient, and so much cheaper because it's opened up the hobby in many, many ways. Now, um, I've still got some more old gear around here, which I've, the reason I've done this is because I found a whole lot of the stuff when I was tidying up my spring clean. And I thought you might like to see how things have changed. And what I'll do is if I find any more cool stuff, I will do some more videos on the changes that have happened, certainly from the electronic side of things. So if you've got questions, comments, anything to add, any of your own experiences, please put them in the comment section on this video and everyone can read them. And if I need to, I'll respond. In the meantime, thanks for watching. Bye for now.